The finance minister has shorn his hair off and is tweeting up a storm again ahead of next month's budget. And I think bondholders might be worried uh, about bad signs, bad omens. Might they be taking a haircut? Well, uh, he was tweeting about policymaking being inextricably bound with uh, politics. There's nothing like a data-driven value neutral policy, he said. Uh, in other words, one cannot have everything at the same time. You have to have priorities within your existing resources. You must balance your books. You must internalize your budget constraints. I think many South Africans are objecting to rising tax hikes and talks of introducing more fines as a means to increase government revenue. Uh, and this has been especially uh, prevalent with the talk uh, of funding the vaccine through more tax and uh, the recent signing of new tax laws by President Cyril Ramaphosa on the 20th of uh, January. And the question that is barely asked, though, in all of this is whether South Africans actually understand the factors that determine tax price hikes and what the new tax laws actually mean for them. We've invited John DeToy, attorney and head of tax technical at Tax Consulting uh, Africa to come and share some insights into how that process works. Jean, uh, welcome to Business Talk. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, when we look at those factors, what factors does the government use? What is thrown into that pot when it comes to decision-making around uh, whether or not certain taxes will be increased uh, or certain spending should be reined in. How does that process work? Well, in, in terms of the process, um, it is quite difficult to say, but I think ultimately what the government would look at is if it is feasible to raise taxes. I think the, the most telling sign that we've seen uh, in many, many years is uh, during the medium-term budget speech, uh, the Minister of Finance actually conceded for the first time that raising taxes or introducing additional taxes uh, would impact on our economic growth. So I think what, or the, the penny has finally dropped that you can you can only tax our small individual tax base to a certain degree. And if they raise those tax rates or introduce further wealth taxes or anything of the like, it would only have a detrimental effect. Mm. We, it does feel like we're rapidly approaching the law of diminishing returns. So the more you increase taxes, uh, in fact, the less tax you get back as a result. It's known as the Laffer curve uh, with, uh, within tax circles and, and you tax geeks that love talking about the, La the Laffer curve. How exactly does the Laffer curve work? Well, I think in very basic terms, it simply means that by increasing tax rates or introducing additional taxes, your aim is obviously to collect more revenue. But if you reach that point or the top of the Laffer curve, by doing that, you'll actually your returns or the amount of taxes that you actually collect will be will, will start reducing. Um, and the reason for that is, is obviously manifold. Either it, it impacts on taxpayer morality, people either feel that they are being overtaxed and they um, start behaving in a certain way to either plan their taxes or through some distorted place of morality, they feel that they, they do not need to pay their fair share any longer. Or in our case, where we have a lot of expatriates at the moment leaving our shores, um, they finally decide that this is the point where they cut their ties with the country and they cease their tax residency and we, f we lose them to the tax base forever. And that's uh, financial immigration. Uh, what's the latest on financial immigration? Because there have been some developments in that space. Uh, and I agree with you. There is a sense that tax morality is declining. Now, whether you agree or, or not, I think it is a reality. Many taxpayers feel like their money is being squandered, pilfered, stolen. And so that social contract with the state is starting to break down. And I think Edward Keyswetter, as the New South Commissioner over the last uh, while, has his hands full in trying to repair that broken trust. He's doing uh, an unenviable job. I don't think anybody would want to take over and clean up following the years of um, uh, hollowing out of SARS that we saw, but there's still a lot, a lot that needs to be done. On the financial immigration front, though, I don't, know, don't want to diverge too far from that. What is the latest developments? Well, with the, the introduction or the, the promulgation of the new tax amendment, Acts. Uh, it's now confirmed that the financial immigration process for tax purposes, which relates to where you want to withdraw your retirement funding from South Africa when you immigrate or leave the country, 
Normally, you would only conduct that process through the South African Reserve Bank. And once that process is finalized, you would be able to withdraw your retirement benefits fully and immediately, known as financial immigration, as you noted. But now with the, the promulgation of the amendments, um, the financial immigration process has been phased out entirely. And if you want to withdraw your retirement funds upon leaving the country, it's subject to an entirely different test, which is that you need to prove to SARS that you have not been resident for an uninterrupted period of at least three years before you can access those funds. And that is applicable from 1 March. An this uninterrupted year. period of three years. So, I mean, in effect, uh, those funds would then be tied up uh, for, for that full period before you would uh, be allowed access to them. Absolutely. And that's the, the primary problem that people have with this amendment is because people withdraw their retirement funds to, they, they actually use that money to set themselves up in their new home country. I mean, it is an expensive thing, obviously, to emigrate and you would need additional, you'd need the capital to, to make that work for you. Is there any way around this? Uh, for example, if I wanted to immigrate in and I knew I'd be moving in three years' time. Could I make an early application so that the funds would become available? From what I'm hearing you say, you need to prove uh, that you haven't been resident for three years. So that doesn't seem like an option. Is there any way around this? Well, in the very, very short term, you can still file your financial immigration process until uh, the 28th of February, which so essentially you have a month to file your application. And if you get that in before the deadline of 1 March, you can still take out your money under the old dispensation. Uh, but other than that, then you need to cease your, your tax residency as soon as possible. Or if you have already left the country a while back and you haven't financially emigrated or withdrawn your funds, then you need to somehow prove to SARS that in fact, you left the country uh, quite a while ago and when you did so you you had the intention to leave permanently and you have in fact not been resident for three or three plus years otherwise you'll have to be subject to that three-year lock-in it does seem uh, overly draconian it does also seem uh, and one can only speculate uh, as to the reasons but like uh, SARS and Treasury and government are worried about the brain drain and are trying to make it a little bit more difficult for South Africans to move. Are you seeing more clients approaching you, wanting to immigrate, wanting to financially immigrate? Is it a trend that you're noticing at, uh, at Tax, South Af uh, Tax Africa? Yeah, I think, well, absolutely. Since they, they made the announcement back in during the budget speech last year, and it became quite clear that there'll be a, a more stringent, or as you put it, the draconian test, uh, there's been a flurry of applications on our end. Uh, people absolutely pushing to get their funds out under the old dispensation, at least from our side, definitely. Now, what happens to those funds from a tax perspective um, after the three years? How, how are they taxed if you are considering immigration and you say, right, I've, I've got funds to move and I'm gonna have to wait the full three years. What rate are they taxed at when you withdraw them from a, a retirement annuity, whatever um, vehicle they've been in? Yeah, so they, uh, retirement funds are subject to a slightly more favorable rate. At the moment, they are taxed at a, a maximum of 36%. Um, but that rate has remained stagnant for, for quite a while. So one can speculate a bit that with these retirement funds now being locked in South Africa, um, it is it may be a low hanging fruit for government to increase that tax rate. Um, and before a lot of South Africans take out their funds from, from the country in the near future, they might increase that, that rate to get a, the, the last pound of flesh, if I can put it that way. Yeah, and the, the, we certainly know that the fiscus is scratching around for every last cent that it can find because of that uh, yawning deficit. And uh, while there have been... Uh, some signs that government's trying to commit to uh, reining in expenditure, particularly around the public sector wage bill. There's a lot of political water that needs to flow under that uh, bridge before we have any certainty that government is actually going to be able to deliver on those uh, spending cuts. Uh, so uh, the other side of the coin is therefore tax increases. And I want to come back to the, the, the point of tax increases in a pandemic, in an environment, John, we had the IMF uh, this week, 
uh, upgrading global growth because uh, the, the vaccines are being rolled out globally perhaps slightly quicker than was initially anticipated, but downgrading growth uh, next year for South Africa. So while the rest of the world is, is really emerging from this pandemic, we, we still seem stuck in an environment like that. Uh, how likely is it that government uh, can actually raise taxes? Well, that's the thing. It's like an, an, a Gordian knot. You, it's an equation that you, you can't solve. Um, I think what they may do, I don't think that they can increase tax rates um, henceforth. In other words, push the, the brackets up even higher. What they may do is they may impose a once-off progressive tax, um, like a solidarity tax, something that we've seen in Mauritius uh, for, for people earning above a certain threshold. Uh, we've also seen um, the likes of, you know, Judge Dennis Davis coming out and saying that, well, actually, the, the people who should be paying their fair share is still not paying what they should be. So there is an argument perhaps to be made that the ones that do carry the tax burden, sure, they are being taxed to the hilt, but there is still some room, um, even, although it is only a, a small margin, they can still squeeze a little bit more revenue out of these individuals. Now, what the, the long-term knock-on effect of that would be is anyone's guess, but I think government is perhaps considering imposing a once-off progressive tax. Um, but I don't think you can do much more than that other than perhaps keeping the, the tax brackets stagnant, um, which, in other words, you don't adjust it for inflation. Yeah, and uh, you, you don't adjust for that uh, so-called bracket creep uh, as well. Uh, it reminds me of um, what happened under former, former, former finance minister Derek Keyes uh, through the transition to democracy. There was uh, back then a once-off uh, so-called solidarity tax, and I am increasingly hearing uh, that that uh, is on the table. And then back to your point made about Judge Dennis Davis and the Davis Tax Committee. They uh, produced a flurry of papers over December and he seems to feel that there is um, some low hanging fruit in terms of that gap. This is not the, the budget deficit, but the gap between what should be collected and what is collected and whether or not people are uh, evading or avoiding tax. Uh, and you know, obviously the one is legal, the other is uh, illegal, uh, but SARS should be doing its job in this effect uh, anyway. I mean, surely SARS has all of these powers to look into your bank accounts, to uh, to reconcile all of the third party data it has at its disposal. Do you expect SARS to be uh, cracking down on high net worth taxpayers as it looks and scrounges for every last penny? Are you expecting to see more things like audits uh, arising over the next few months? Yeah, well, I, I do think that that's, that's probably the only answer is to not hike tax, rate, tax rates, but improve collection. Um, and we have seen, very interestingly, over the last couple of months, SARS is issuing notices where they, they inform taxpayers that they are looking at their offshore assets. They are using uh, information that they received under the automatic exchange of information, which is a first, even though it's been in place since 2017, uh, which means that they are, it looks at least like they are looking at pools of revenue that they have thus far not utilized. Um, I mean, Judge Dennis Davis has been advocating for years that they should be looking at trust structures and offshore assets because SARS is not auditing those the, the affairs of these taxpayers. And it looks like SARS is now deciding that they, they have no other option. They have to look to untapped pools of revenue. Well, I'm all for paying unto Caesar what is due to Caesar in a, in a fair and open and transparent way. I'm also all for individual taxpayers being able to structure their tax affairs to pay uh, as little tax as possible within the letter of the law. Uh, what opportunities are there for um, employees at the moment with those new tax laws that have been uh, signed uh, just uh, the other day? It does seem like the, the scope to plan is diminishing with each passing year. So I was trying to close loopholes and that sort of thing. What stands out for you amongst the suite of changes? Well, I think in terms of tax planning, there is, uh, I mean, SARS again bolstered that the anti-avoidance rules relating to trusts. So Treasury and SARS and the legislature is very much trying to to stop every loophole in that respect. If they see it, they close it every year. That's, that's what happens. So 
from that perspective, it brings into question whether trust structures and these types of things are in fact tax efficient. Um, if you are a South African tax resident, unfortunately, planning wise, there isn't much that you can do other than the traditional ways such as, you know, imposing or utilizing certain allowances or benefits that are taxed at a lower rate or by contributing to a, a pension fund to a larger degree, which is uh, which gets you a, a tax deduction. Uh, but other than that, I don't think it's, there's not much freedom to plan, if I can call it that. Right. Uh, and I, I know a lot of people argue on the RA that while you may get the tax saving during the, the lifetime of, of saving, you actually taxed when you start uh, drawing uh, income from, a, from an annuity. So, but I think I've seen research from PhD that uh, tends to indicate that over time, it, it is still a, a much more efficient way of planning. And then we've also got our tax-free savings products. But again, you know, I think at a, uh, an upper bound annual limit of just over 33,000 Rand, uh, I think for many, uh, it's, just, it's just not enough. Um, there's also this issue for employers here that uh, they can now uh, tax uh, employee expense claims. Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, it's more, it's actually a relaxation of a, a law that was already in place. So normally when you go on a business trip and you are required to spend a night away from your normal place of residence um, and you incur certain incidental expenses and um, like on meals and accommodation and such, you can be reimbursed by your employer for that. And that reimbursement would be tax free. So what they did now was they expanded that to include trips, day trips, not only trips where you have to spend the night away from your home. And you can also claim those reimbursements tax-free provided that your employer, uh, its policies makes provision for such a claim and for, for give, giving you such reimbursements. And then just lastly, this issue around uh, Adobe expiring, and I think we all saw the messages popping up on our web browsers for the longest time. We knew it was going to happen. So I seem to be caught unawares. And uh, once again, I'll go back to what happened and uh, the previous SARS commissioner, the IT division was completely hollowed out. The solution now was to create an entirely new browser, uh, which seems a little odd considering that um, Adobe has been uh, rendered obsolete and unsafe by all of the other browsers. Why not just go and look for another solution rather than build an entire browser to accommodate Adobe, uh, which is unsafe? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I, I believe that even, I mean, they, they've had a lot of legacy issues with the old administration, but, um, and I do think that they are trying to improve their, their technology at SARS at a, at a rapid pace. But I mean, everyone knew that the license would expire. Um, so in this instance, I don't really think there is an excuse. What they did there doesn't really make sense to me either. Yeah, I think we're all left to scratching our heads a little bit there, John. Uh, just as a parting comment uh, for taxpayers out there, as uh, the, um, the, the tax filing season uh, approaches for the full year, what would your uh, bit of advice be uh, for taxpayers who might be unsure, unsighted about some of the changes that are going on? What would your advice be? I think the, the most important change that is has now come into effect is the fact that in line with the, the commissioner's zero tolerance policy on non-compliance is the fact that previously you could only be held criminally liable for mistakes or for flouting your tax obligations if it came with an element of intent. In other words, you acted willfully um, and without just cause. But the act has now been amended to say that you can also be guilty of a criminal offense if you act negligently. Um, in other words, for example, if you fail to update or register your, your uh, tax details or if you fail to submit a return and you even did so out of pure ignorance, you can now be charged criminally um, and that comes with a two-year prison sentence under certain circumstances. So I think the message is purely that uh, that's your cue to just take more ownership of your tax affairs because effectively with this law change, you are held to a higher standard. I think that's a very important point for taxpayers to be mindful of. And also that, um, you know, SARS can withhold your refund if you are under criminal investigation, I believe. And who knows how long that can take with the way the wheels of justice grind increasingly slowly in this country. 
Exactly. Uh, but it is important to note that that's a criminal investigation in terms of the Tax Administration Act specifically. Um, so, but you, you are correct. A criminal investigation instituted in terms of the Tax Administration Act would take equal, as long as any other criminal investigation. So it's just another reminder to stay squeaky clean as far as you can. That is, uh, I think, the take home message. John DeToy at Tax Consultants South Africa, thanks so much for your insights uh, going through the brass tax of tax with us here on Business Talk. Take care. Great. Thanks for having me.